Hi guys, it is a gorgeous day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in the heart of Texas on this beautiful late December 2019 morning. This will be the last interview that I have here at Collapse Chronicles. My name is Sam Mitchell and this is Collapse Chronicles and this will be the final interview of 2019 as we peer into 2020 and I cannot think of a better man to be interviewing uh, than this fellow who I admit guys I had not heard of until a few weeks ago and this is Dr. B. Sidney Smith, and anybody not aware of um, Dr. Smith will be in the next few minutes, I assure you, just to uh, let you know who I'm getting ready to talk to. Dr. B. Sidney Smith is a former college math teacher and an active member of the Green Party, having served as Virginia State Party co-chair General Secretary and National Delegate, Smith has studied humanity's ecological overshoot for more than 10 years and in the last few years has spoken and written on the issue with a special focus on adaptation to near-term collapse. He lives on five acres in central Virginia with his wife, dog, chickens, and geese. And that is about all I know about this man. So uh, Sid Smith, come on, say hello to the folks, and then we're just going to dive right into this organic conversation. Well, thank you, and hello, and uh, uh, thank you, Sam, for inviting me on. It's an honor, uh, and uh, I'm very pleased to, to be able to have this conversation. Right, and we're pleased to have you along, uh, Sid. So, guys, once again, I'm going to try to go out of character here. Uh, I'm going to sp- I'm going to talk for a few minutes to get this ball rolling, and then I'm just going to let Sid Smith take over. Uh, Sid has his own YouTube channel with only two videos on it, titled "How to Enjoy the End of the World." and Humanity, the Final Chapter, and these are required, they're each about an hour, you need to listen to both of those videos for a whole lot of the background of what we're getting ready to talk about, but what I want to do, I have asked Sid to kind of jump ahead to uh, the end of one of those videos, where he pretty much, and this was uh, over a year ago, just spelled out where we're standing. So, Sid Smith, what I want you to do is pull no punches, give the folks the unvarnished truth with a capital T of where we stand as a global industrial civilization in the opening bell of 2020, and then we're going to come back later and talk about how we're going to navigate the the next 20 to 50 years on this planet. But where do we stand right now in the opening bell of 2020? Well, it's, it's pretty interesting to me because we're seeing uh, collapse unfold uh, and, and, and to begin to accelerate in ways that make it really kind of in your face. Um, and... Uh, and we're seeing all of the classical symptoms in society uh, of, of uh, a collapsing society. And, of course, as you know from, from my talk, How to Enjoy the End of the World, that, that title is not meant to be ironic. That's, I'm, I'm sincere. Uh, we do need to find out how to enjoy it. Um, and, and it's essential that uh, in order to uh, get to a human future, we, we need this collapse to occur. And we need it to occur uh, pretty quickly. And uh, as you say, at the end of that, the how to enjoy the end of the world, I, I make it pretty plain why, but let me just run over the main points. Um, the ecosystem is collapsing. Uh, extinctions are accelerating. Um, we've lost uh, 60% of vertebrates. We've lost 40% of fish. We've lost over 90% of, of uh, uh, apex predator fish. Those are the ones we mostly eat. Um, uh, insect declines are ranging from 45 to 80 percent, depending upon where you look, and that, of course, is absolutely catastrophic for 
uh, every other part of the food web. Um, so we're losing our ecosystem, without which there's no physical basis for, for any level of human civilization. Um, and uh, we're now seeing the kinds of uh, uh, feedback in the climate system that were anticipated, uh, most especially just at the present moment. Uh, Australia is essentially on fire. Um, the average temperature, the average high temperature the other day in Australia was 105 degrees Fahrenheit. That's averaged across the entire continent. And uh, there are over 100 fires burning uh, completely out of control. And the fires that have burned so far have already released um, uh, more CO2 than Australians themselves do in a year um, just from their normal activities. So that's a huge feedback in terms of greenhouse gases. And, of course, the ecological devastation is enormous. Um, we're seeing uh, extreme oscillations politically. Um, you know, we're all familiar with the fact that uh, Trump was impeached yesterday and Johnson uh, won an election in the UK, which is quite possibly going to lead to the breakup of the United Kingdom. We have uh, enormous um, protests occurring in Chile, and we have a coup in Bolivia. We have protests in Hong Kong. We have protests out of control in France. Um, all of these are are part of and symptomatic of uh, general chaos that is beginning to set in and which I see is accelerating. So I think 2020 is going to be a very interesting year. Uh, I couldn't begin to predict where we're going to be 12 months from now, um, but it's looking, it's looking crazy. Uh, so as I said, it's important that this all occur because if it didn't occur, if this system continued to lurch onwards for another 10 or 20 years, um, it may very well mean on the side it could destroy the biosphere. So we need to be very pleased that, it, that it's not going to continue. Okay, so are you, I heard 10 to 20 years in, in your previous talk that I heard on YouTube, mm -hmm. you were saying that you do not see how global industrial civilization can can make it 20 years. So I, I know you're no. loath to make predictions on one hand, mm -hmm. but is it safe to say you, you don't see this holding together for, for 20 years maximum? Well, you know, I don't think so. I hope not, because if it did, as I say, the effects would be extremely catastrophic. I mean, it, that really could mean near-term human extinction if it continued for another 20 years, along with most of the other species on the planet. Um, so, I mean, the first thing I have to say is I hope very much it doesn't continue for 20 years. And, and honestly, it's very hard for me to see how it can continue for, for even 10 more years. Um, but you know, the collapse is ongoing. So the question isn't when is collapse going to occur. It's occurring. The question is how quickly and in what manner. Uh, and, and that's something we just have to hold on to our backsides and, and, uh, uh, and try to follow along with and adapt to as best we can. But it's happening right now, and the question is, will it happen quickly enough? Will the, will the drawdown of our economic activity occur quickly enough um, so that our destructive impact is, is not too great for the planet and the future to handle? Okay, I, I I just spent several minutes before we turned the the microphone on. I, I was I was asking Sid to be. You can find a whole lot of math, mathematical and scientific theory and whatnot in his videos. Uh, so I ask him not to get deep too deep into this, but I do want you to spend a few minutes because I I really liked how you apply this whole idea of energy invested and energy out, not just a way where we've heard it like with fracking, uh, but to global industrial civilization itself. So without getting too technical and mathematical, can you e explain that part of your talk about ERO, EI, and how it applies to the collapse of global industrial civilization? I think, I think the least widely understood aspect of this, uh, including among people who have studied it closely and, and, and even among people who, who should know the physics, the least understood aspect of this is how energy flowing 
through the physical world is what animates the entire business. Um, how much energy flows through uh, our bodies and our things and our connections and our civilization determines the size and complexity of that civilization. So the reason we have this enormous industrial civilization is because the amount of energy flowing through civilization between 1800 and now um, went up about 50 times per capita. Um, and so there's a hugely greater amount of energy flowing. Um, and, and all of that energy, you know, in, input into the system made it grow and expand and become extremely complex. Everyone knows that that energy source was fossil fuel and that that's a finite resource and we've, we've used up a great deal of it and we're now um, somewhere on the downslope of, of what's called the Hubbard Curve um, so that the amount of energy available to us to use is going to decline and decline and decline and decline. Um, as the amount of energy, excess energy available to us declines, as a simple matter of physics, the amount of activity must also decline. So economic activity, social activity, social complexity, um, all of these things have to decline just as a simple matter of physics. We can't somehow magically keep a complex civilization going uh, without the energy that's required to make it run. Now, there are a lot of people who say, well, you know, maybe we can get another form of energy. Maybe we can get fusion energy or we can somehow uh, ramp up solar and so on and so forth. And without getting into any of the details, none of these um, the details of, of exactly why, none of these can replace uh, the role of fossil fuels in the system. And even if they could, it wouldn't solve the myriad other problems that we're facing uh, in terms of collapse, which is ecological overshoot, resource depletion, and so on and so forth. It would only continue to accelerate us toward that cement wall that we're rapidly approaching. So um, I, on energy return on investment, it's very interesting to note that uh, as 2019 comes to a close, um, you know, the United States is poised in 2020 to become a net oil exporter for the very first time. Uh, since we hit peak conventional oil in the 1970s. Uh, and people are looking at that and saying, well, what do you mean we don't have enough energy? We've got more energy than ever before, at least in the United States. Well, that's true and it's not true. Um, and here's where the EROEI comes in. Um, most of that excess oil that's allowed us to suddenly, you know, have a great deal more than we had 10 years ago is from unconventional sources, especially fracking. But also in North America, we have the tar sands up in Canada. And both the, the shale oil fracking industry and the tar sands industry are in a very curious position. I was just looking at the Wall Street Journal. Um, and in August, they pointed out that uh, while the amount of oil that they're producing and their total revenues um, before expenses have skyrocketed since 2014 when there was a lot of worry about them. And the price of oil has doubled, which is enormously helpful to oil producers because it means they you know, get a lot more money for their product. Despite all of that, their cash flow is not only negative, but it has gotten increasingly more negative as time has gone by. So that in the quarter just passed, uh, they had here a, a basket of seven representative uh, oil producers. Their cash flow was a negative one and a half billion dollars. And their, uh, uh, their earnings have continued to decline at the same time that the amount of oil they're pumping is going up, and the price of oil is also going up. So what is happening here? Well, the amount of energy they're having to put into getting the energy out is more than they're actually getting out. And this is hidden in the financials, so people don't really see it. They don't say, oh, they're burning more oil um, to get the oil out than they're getting out because they're not literally burning more oil, but they are using resources that ultimately rely upon oil and other energy sources to produce. So the EROEI on fracking and on tar sands has proven itself to be too low to make it a going concern. Sure, they're getting the oil out, but it's creating a huge debt bubble because they're not making any money. So and, take uh, that. When, that all, when that all comes home, we're going to discover that by and you know it doesn't matter how much oil we produce if we don't get enough excess energy over and above what it costs us to produce it, then it, we've come to the end of the party. 
Yeah, so, so take that whole concept, how it applies to fossil fuels, and uh, apply it to global industrial civilization. Uh, are, are we putting more energy, I, I mean, can you extrapolate for what you just said about fossil fuels to the entire global industrial civilization that we're getting a lot less energy out than we're putting in, and is, this can only last for so long? So it, it might be worthwhile to focus, still sticking with the with the fracking industry on on a particular aspect of this. The reason they can't make money, despite selling a whole bunch of oil, is because they have to keep drilling new wells. And the reason they have to keep drilling new wells is because the capital that they're using to conduct this enterprise is is uh, investment capital, which means it has to be returned with interest. So. Uh, Gail Tverberg has, and I know you've interviewed her, has a has a splendid analysis of this. That that debt kind of pulls the economy forward. In a healthy economy, you have you have uh, capitalization, which involves debt at interest, and that that pulls the economy forward by creating the jobs and the opportunities and so on to build the economy. But when the energy isn't actually there, despite the fact that you can kind of disguise what's going on by financializing everything, the fact of the matter is that debt is no longer causing growth. And so despite the fact we have all this oil coming, um, there's, there's no actual economic growth associated with it because one way or another, all that excess energy is being soaked up just to get the energy. So now expand that to global industrial civilization. It's, that's that's uh, uh, the microcosm. The macrocosm is that in global industrial civilization, despite the fact that it's busy as bees and there's, we're burning more fossil fuel than ever before, there's no actual economic growth in the real economy. Instead, the real economy is declining. It's been declining in the West since the 70s, and it's now declining in Asia and India, despite the fact that they've just gone through 20 years of a, a coal-burning bonanza. Um, and so the, the EROEI, you can, try to, you can try to avoid the consequences, but as a matter of fact, we can no longer actually have economic growth. And when there's no economic growth, that means that financialization ultimately leads to a situation of economic collapse. And when the economic collapse occurs, then there's a lot of creative destruction and we, and we drop down to a lower level of, uh, of complexity and economic activity. And, and that's what we're going to see. I suspect this year, I, it's very hard to see how we won't get something going on this year. All the, all the indications are pointing to a financial correction. The only question is, will it be the big one or will it be another, you know, half step like 2008 was that sort of slows things down, but then there's a recovery. Um, we just don't know. Yeah, all, all of the things we we don't know, but uh, I, I want to go back to 2012. This is from your website, uh, All mm -hmm. the Bunnies in the Meadow Die. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's see. That's one old math lecture I used to give about exponential growth. Yeah, I mean you can find that in one of his in one of those videos on his website. Uh, well, let me start here. I, I'm, I'm looking. I'm go, I'm going down to the bottom of this essay just in case you have it in front of you. Said so. Mm -hmm. I, I think that this sentence is what the, the message I have been uh, trying to. Th th this is collapse chronicles in a nutshell. Human ecological overshoot is the defining fact of life on Earth for the foreseeable future. This issue, meaning human ecological overshoot, does not just dwarf other issues. It absorbs every issue, political, cultural, economic, and environmental into itself. So I want you to take a, 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 a rip on this. Give us a little bit of, of your definition of human ecological overshoot. I think most of us are somewhat are uh, familiar with it. Give us a short definition and then just expand on that about how this issue does not just dwarf other issues. It absorbs every other issue. Sure. Well, ecological overshoot is, is a commonplace thing uh, in the world. Um, it's 
you know, it's it's one of the ways in which ecosystems uh, self-correct and come back into balance. So, for example, if a if a disease wipes out apex predators in a region, then uh, there will suddenly be an overshoot of prey animals, and then there will be starvation and so on, and things kind of go back and forth until some kind of equilibrium is achieved again. Um, so ecological overshoot isn't an unusual thing. It's not even an unusual thing for humanity. Humans have, have, have been in ecological overshoot regionally many, many times over the course of the last many thousands of years. What's different this time is we're in ecological overshoot globally um, because we've learned how to get around all of those external controls that nature typically puts in place, famine, disease, predators, and so on. Um, and, and the result is that we're using up the planet um, about twice as fast as the planet can recover. Uh, ecological overshoot day uh, in 2019 occurred um, actually at the end of July. So that's, that's a little more than half the year before humanity had used up uh, in, in just seven months about a year's worth of what the planet can produce in terms of uh, uh, ecological or what are called ecosystem services, right? So the, the hydrologic cycle and, and waste processing and so on and so forth. So we're, we're vastly an overshoot of our environment. And, uh, and there's only one cure for that, and that is a die-off. There, there is no other way to cure uh, ecological overshoot. And the longer it's uh, uh, delayed, the more severe it will have to be in order to bring things back into balance. I and mean, nature wins in the end. Right. I, I always think of Wendell Berry's uh, famous quote that nature um, has more votes and a longer memory and a sterner sense of justice than we do, and it's a party to all of our activities. Um, so in, in the end, we have to pay that piper. Um, so the, the other thing I think that people have a hard time getting their heads around with respect to overshoot is that our civilization isn't something we can script. Civilization, this is a mathematical term, but, but civilization is an emergent property. That is to say, it arises out of the thousands and hundreds and thousands and millions of interactions between individuals that occur all over the globe every day, right? And it just, civilization is something that arises out of that. There's no human being that carries within them the blueprint for civilization any more than a single ant carries within it the blueprint for an anthill. Instead, the, the, the anthill or the beehive or the human civilization is something that emerges out of all of the interactions that occur. So you can't script it. It just is going to do what it does. And clearly what ours is going to do is it's going to continue uh, in the mode that it has been doing for the last hundred years or so ago until it no longer can. Um, there's just no way to prevent it. Uh, continuing to do so. And a lot of people take issue with that. They say, well, that's very fatalistic, or you have too low an opinion of human beings. I don't. I have a very high opinion of human beings. But I think I know something about our limitations. And one of the things we can't do is script what civilization does. We don't have that power. It's not that kind of a thing. Um, so uh, regarding and absorbing every issue, I think if you look around, it becomes pretty clear um, from politics. Um, politics at present is driven by the stressors that are a consequence of human overshoot. That includes what we're seeing in the United States and what we're seeing in Britain and Germany and everywhere else. Uh, and that's only going to continue. We're seeing it in our culture. Um, people are becoming less and less rational in their civic life. Everyone is siloing themselves into their own reality so that you know, if you if you compare impeachment this time to impeachment in the 70s, for example, in the 70s, the center, there was a strong political center and people had allegiance to it, regardless of their political party. Here we are 40 years later and there is no political center and everyone's in their own reality. And so it's just open warfare. Um, that's that is itself a consequence of the kinds of stressors you expect uh, to happen when there's overshoot. Um, and of course, the economic and environmental we've already covered. So, so ecological overshoot really does absorb everything else. The world doesn't make sense anymore unless you start with, oh, we're in overshoot, and now it will begin to make sense. If you don't start from there, then nothing makes any sense. It's just all this crazy stuff going on, and you can't think why. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't understand. The, the why is it the biggest story on the planet instead of Donald Trump's impeachment, which seems to be the entire news today? I don't, mm -hmm. I, I don't remember seeing the terms human ecological overshoot anywhere in the mainstream <laughs> media, yeah. even on the science pages. Uh, uh -huh. I, I, bet, I bet you could go through every story on Yahoo News and Google News 
and the the every single story on both of those new services you will not see the the term human ecological overshoot ever mentioned while it is the single biggest uh, issue on the planet mm-hmm. you know what are what's it what's it going to take for human ecological overshoot to to move to even make it into the mainstream media much less to the top of the headlines i don't think there's any reason to expect that it ever will even even if even if the worst features of collapse are realized and it becomes obvious what's going on, I, I don't think it will ever make it into the mainstream discussion. Or or I, I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't, um, because that's not our story. You know, people people have to make sense of their lives through some kind of narrative, and and our modern mythos doesn't make room for that. Our modern mythos is the one of inevitable and and continuing and permanent human progress. Uh, and, and the idea that somehow we're subject to the basic ecological principles that cause rabbits to die off in a given year uh, just doesn't fit that narrative at all. So that's not a story that people can tell themselves or one another. So this is just one when you know, what I like to say is uh, there's going to be a lot of people, you know, like when, was it Mount Vesuvius, whatever that volcano was in 79. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Pompeii, uh, uh-huh. Yeah, Pompeii, where you see those... The, the joke about the mummies, those ashen mummies with the teacup lifted to their lips and the surprised look on their face after that volcano had been rumbling for the past 10 years in their backyards. Is is that what well, we're going to have a lot of, is surprise? Uh, I, 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 I wish it could be uh, so picturesque and peaceful, but I don't anticipate that. Um, you know, people are going to need to have, and they do need to have stories about what's going wrong because things are obviously going wrong. And that's where, that's where a lot of the political turmoil comes from. Um, people see that things are wrong. They, they feel, they sense that things are not going well for them. And it doesn't match the story that they're supposed to be able to rely upon, right? We're not headed toward the Star Trek reality. We're headed toward one of those awful dystopias. Um, and, uh, and people need a reason for that. And the idea that it's nobody's fault is not an easy one to, to live with. It's much, much easier to say, well, it's their fault or it's their fault or it's because of this or it's because of that. And so you get, um, you get the kind of political divisions that we have going on now and the kind of astonishing irrationality. Uh, this, is, this is not something new. This is, this, if you look back in history to collapsing civilizations, it's, it's very common for the populace to latch on to uh, millennialism and, and apocalypse and, and really kind of strange sort of cults. Um, I mean, we can point to things like flat earthers, for example, and, and I could name a few others, except I'm sure that, that some of our listeners probably would be irritated if I did. So, but, but, you know, there's all these various kinds of irrational narratives that take place. And, and the biggest concern is that we'll see an enormous amount of social disorder and, uh, and people not being good to each other. Um, and but that again, that's if you, if you remember from the, the the essay on all the bunnies in the meadow die. You know, at the end, the bunnies eat each other. They don't have any choice. Um, so, in the United States, we have a particular challenge because uh, we're used to being on top. Um, you know, people often point to the statistic that Americans use a larger proportion per capita of the Earth's resources than anybody else, and it sort of leaves hanging in the air this. Um, uh, this presumption that it's because Americans are a bunch of greedy, self-important so-and-sos, right? Um, but that's not true. I've, I've met a lot of Americans, and I've met a lot of people who are not Americans. I happen to be an American. Um, and, and the fact is we're all just folks. Um, Americans aren't especially greedy. The reason we use up so much resources is because of uh, uh, the history of uh, how we have come to have economic hegemony since World War II, starting with the Bretton Woods Agreement, which allowed us to have seniorage. We got to print money without uh, having to cope with any of the consequences that usually come with printing too much money because we managed to make the dollar the uh, world reserve currency. And when we defaulted on that, and on the gold standard in 1974, then we switched over to petrodollars, and we still enjoy enormous economic hegemony, which means that things are cheaper if you're an American than they are for anybody else in the world. And when things are cheaper, you buy more. That's how it works. Um, But that's coming to an end. And the psychological shock 
and the social shock to Americans is going to be extreme and, so far as I'm aware, unprecedented in human history. So nobody knows what that's going to do to us. It's going to be extraordinary. Okay. So, okay. yeah, I, I wish we could all just be sitting there frozen in time with our teacup to our lips, but I don't think it's going to be that pretty. <laughs> All right, well, I, I see we're exactly at 30 minutes in, in, into this conversation, so I, I want to start look, looking ahead about how we're going to deal with this, but I want to continue with your, before we get into these questions, I'm going to get right up to, to the questions, and I'm referring back to the final paragraph of your All the Bunnies in the Meadow Die. Okay, mm -hmm. let's just... Where did I leave? Okay. Far too many people are still asking how we can avoid the consequences of overshoot. This is like someone who is already falling asking how to avoid hitting the ground. Just, uh, just, just flesh that out a little bit. Uh, right. So um, what's occurring now isn't something that we can prevent because uh, all, the, all the important things have already happened. We're already in overshoot. There isn't a way to fix the system um, because the system's already broken. Uh, there are too many human beings. And uh, we have an industrial civilization that's unsustainable on its energy base uh, and on its resource base. So, um, you know, all the bills are coming due and we haven't got anything to pay them with. Uh, so uh, there's a tremendous amount. I mean, I was looking, you know, I, I, I have a Facebook account and, and people post these things. Uh, there was one about... Uh, um, out of the building submarines to make ice in the Arctic. <laughs> I just, I just had to laugh out loud because there are these these crazy things about how somehow yeah. we're going to fix what's wrong, right? And and people click on them and they believe them because you know it's it's anxious to think about what's happening and you do want there to be a solution. But but ecological overshoot and 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 climate change, which is part of it, and all the other things, they're not problems to be solved. They're predicaments to be adapted to. They're not going away. Um, and, and the sooner people understand that, I think the better chance they have of actually adapting to and, and frankly, enjoying uh, the, the changes that are coming, because in some respects, those changes are going to be very good changes. Um, a lot of people are going to suffer, and there's definitely going to be a correction in our numbers. But, but socially, you know, from a human point of view, in the human culture, uh, I think some of the changes that we can see can be very, very positive changes as well. So uh, I think the sooner we get over um, trying to, to hang on to what we believe we've had and then what, what John Michael Greer calls the mono future, right, that Star Trek world that we all think we were headed to, the sooner we give that up, the sooner we can settle down to the business of saying, okay, this has happened and now is the time to begin to adapt to it. Not to try to prevent it, because that, that, that ship has sailed. Okay, so let's, I think this is uh, the, the time to move to the big questions. All right, we need to start talking and answering some big questions. And you posed some good ones. All right, so let me just read them out, and you can just pretty much uh, finish out this interview answering these, these questions. Okay, the right question is, how can we best cope with and mitigate the consequences? How do we shape our lives to fit the future we have made for ourselves? Or rather, not our lives for that die is cast. So the question, I guess, becomes, what can we do now so that our children's children's children may may have a world to live in in freedom, dignity, and peace. And I think that is all the, the three ways of saying how do we enjoy the end of the world. So how mm -hmm. how do we enjoy it while we still can? So, you know, uh, Ecclesiastes said there's nothing new under the sun, and, and, and there's a lot of truth in that. Human nature is pretty much a constant. And, and how human beings can be happy and live well with one another 
with one another is not a new question. It's an old question, and there's a lot of wisdom on that. Um, I think once you get away from the myth of inevitable human progress and the, and the myth of you know technological saviors and so on and so forth, you come back to the fact that we are social primates um, and we are very uh, cultural animals. Uh, and and the way we live successful, um, meaningful lives is in community and in relationship with one another. Um, so, in, you know, I, I think about we've, we've got two classes of people who are doing exactly the wrong thing because they're still caught up in the myth. One of them is the preppers who are building bunkers and, and stockpiling ammo. Now, I don't mean that maybe you shouldn't have a little ammunition around. I do. Um, but that's not how we're going to have a decent future. Right. And, and, uh, and maybe there'll be something like the zombie apocalypse and people will need to shoot it out for a day or two. But but I hope not. I kind of doubt it. And in any event, even if that occurs, there's still what happens after. Uh, and, and the other kind of people who are still caught up are the, the ultra rich who are building these compounds, you know, in, in little enclaves around the world, you know, spending millions of dollars to, to give themselves a tiny castle to weather the end of the world. And that's just stupid, because, uh, again, w once the once the immediate crisis passes, where are you? Um, the fact is that, and history shows this over and over and over all over the world for the last several millennia, um, those people who survive troubles, who survive crises, who survive bottlenecks and go on to build real human civilizations are the ones who start off by building good, solid communities. And that's, that, I think, is where we all ought to be focused. I hear far too many people ready to tear it all down. Right. There are lots of people who want to tear down our constitutional system or they want to tear down our economic system. And by the way, I'm not in favor of capitalism. That's going to go. But it's going to go all by itself. We don't have to help it. Um, in, instead, we need we need to preserve such institutions as we have because we need the stability and we need to be able to work with one another within our communities for regional and local resilience and adaptation because that is how we will get through to the other side and begin to build something better. And, and that's what we should be focused on doing, is building something better than where we're coming from. Now, obviously, as, as you mentioned, the, there are two things we can say with certainty. First, the size of the human population will drop, human population will drop very substantially. The second mm -hmm. thing we can say with certainty is that the rate of human consumption must decrease to a small fraction of the current average in the developed world. Anything like the current consumer culture will be quite impossible. So who you're talking yes, to and, and is thank a, God. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, what you're proposing is uh, obviously you're saying we're, we're not everyone, particularly everyone's children and grandchildren are, are even going to make it through this, that you're speaking to a much reduced population with a much reduced uh, level of consumption and technology. That, that goes without saying that some mm -hmm. of us, a lot of us are not making it through the bottleneck. Well, you know, that's just the physical situation, uh, and we can't say who. Uh, and, and, you know, another impulse that people have is to say, well, let's make sure it's the other guy and not me. Let's make sure it's those people over there and not our people over here. Um, but I don't think that's the right approach, uh, even, if, even if your first concern is just to survive. And I don't think the first concern should be just to survive. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty base, uh, a pretty mean um, uh, goal to have. I mean, we ought to we ought to be thinking about something much grander because every single one of us is going to die no matter what happens. Um, in, in that sense, everybody's going to die. We already knew that. It's not news. Um, so let's instead focus on on the human story and and make it a good story. And that requires a certain amount of selflessness. But you know, that's the basis of community, and that's what makes us human. You know, community is the habitat of culture, and it's culture that tells us who we are. 
So this is all good. Now, on a personal level, yeah, there's going to be a lot less consumption, and people need to get back to learning how to do real things, you know, so you should be able to grow food, prepare food. You should be able to repair things. You should be able to uh, weave cloth or, or cut wood or do other things, you know. You don't have to be able to do everything because that's, that's what civilization is. It's, it's people being able to specialize. But you should be able to do real things and not make-believe things, which is how most people spend their lives as consumers, is involved with make-believe things. You know, buying People magazine and wearing the latest fashion, that's all, that's all going away. And, and people need to learn to do this in, uh, in the next 10 to 20 years, because if you don't learn to do this minimally, uh, you're probably not going to make it through the bottleneck if if you don't know how to feed yourself w without driving to the local Safeway in your, in your SUV. Well, I think it may even be a, a, a not so much, you know, being able to take care of yourself, although that's something a person should be able to do, but being able to engage with the real world and do real things in cooperation with other people is going to be psychologically necessary. I think the, the biggest challenge people is going to, are going to face is going to be psychological. And we're already seeing, of course, the, the suicide rate and, and other kinds of social disorders, addiction and so on, are skyrocketing. That's going to continue. Um, being able to do real things, engage with the real world, and, and do so with other people is the foundation of human sanity. Uh, and so that's, that's really important, I think, to be able to engage meaningfully with other people. Um, that's that's the biggest thing. If you can't do that and you can't engage with the real world, then you don't have an anchor for your own mind to get you through. And that's going to be needed. And, and, and obviously we're talking about a clearly a much more localized uh, e e economy on a much, much smaller scale. Do you see again, and I know you're loath to make predictions, where we're not going to be able to do what you and I are doing in a, in a few years, and that you're, you're not even going to know if your friends and family, uh, and if you live in Texas, whether your friends and family in New York are dead or alive. We're just going to have to. Do, do you see it, that uh, possible? Well, of course, the, the level of future technology is, is the $64,000 question. You know, will we have uh, maybe local or regional electrical grids? Will there be enough? capacity for heavy industry to make electronics possible, but we still have computing and so on and so forth. I have no way of answering that. I don't think anyone does. I think the more important question is not so much will we have this or that technology, but will we preserve enough uh, civil, uh, social complexity to allow people to master um, uh, advanced things like computer science or engineering? Um, you know, that's one of the greatest risks in a civilizational collapse is you lose knowledge. And uh, uh, the question is, how can we preserve, um, can we preserve, will we preserve enough complexity uh, for people to hold on to the kinds of knowledge that, that allows us to have quantitatively better lives than a lot of people in the past, for example, by being able to treat infections uh, or to communicate over long distances, right? I don't think anyone's going to be traveling over long distances the way we do now. Um, but, you know, even a thousand years ago, people were getting messages from 500 miles away. It just took a long time. Um, so the, the level of technology is the big question. And I, who knows? Who knows how it'll go? I mean, it, there are so many ways that it could all go away entirely, right? Um, uh, catastrophic climate change could do it. Um, nuclear war could do it. Um, uh, an outbreak of virulent diseases could do it. There are so many different ways that can happen, and, and you just don't know. Humanity's always faced an uncertain future, um, but that's okay. That's just part of being human. Um, what we'll end up saving, nobody can say at this point. Okay, I hope, so, I hope it'll be good, but, you know, we'll see. Yes, yeah, so you are not... Uh, it, it, I hear you talking global industrial civilization collapsing in the next 10, mm -hmm. 20 years, but you have never mentioned anywhere so far uh, 44 minutes in, into this conversation. You are obviously not on the near-term human extinction bandwagon where 
we are going to be extinct as a species by the year 2030, which I'm sure a lot of people listening to this believe we are. What do you say to those people who, who, who say that to you? Um, there's absolutely no way of knowing. Um, you know, the, it, it's, it's very hard not to latch on to narratives because narratives gives us, give us a sense of certainty and that's psychologically comforting. The ego, you know, can, can quit freaking out. Um, and, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but I, I think it's pretty common knowledge that protecting our ego is one of our primary motivations. So we latch on to these narratives of what's going to happen so we can have a sense of certainty, even if the narrative is, you know, apocalypse. Um, but... The reality is that we can't know what's going to happen in the future. There could be a global thermonuclear war tomorrow and we'll all be dead. And that, frankly, you know, if you look at it from a purely mathematical point of view, that's as likely as any other outcome uh, of similar gravity. Um, we've narrowly escaped that outcome too many times for comfort just in the last 20 years. Um, so that can happen. We could see um, a rapid rise in global temperature of 10 degrees centigrade. That's a possibility. Um, that would certainly uh, impact the biosphere at least as severely uh, as an asteroid impact. And, and Lord knows what, if anything, would survive if that occurred. Not because 10 degrees centigrade is so much hotter. In fact, the Earth has mostly been 10 degrees centigrade warmer than it is right now, but because of the abruptness of the change, yeah. right? because of the rate of change, it would be so serious. So there are lots of ways that we could all become extinct. Um, so that would because I, I was a little confused and 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 I, I'm glad you brought this up because people listening to your your videos on your on your YouTube channel, which guys, once again, you need to listen to both of those videos. You mentioned that as a possibility of 10C mm -hmm. by 2100. I haven't heard many people talking about it. I'm just curious what you're basing that on. And were you implying in that video that if that did happen, that this the human biological organism could survive in a 10C world? Well, certainly it could survive in a 10C world, but it can't survive in a, in a world without a functioning ecosystem, and that's the risk. Again, it's not, the, it's not how much hotter, it's how quickly it gets hotter. Um, and the reason that's a possibility, the 10C is a possibility, is because we don't know um, how the climate system will adapt to the changes that are currently happening, right? Um, it's a complex system, and, and, and I, you know, I don't want to get into mathematics, but the nature of complex systems is you have no way of knowing in advance how they will respond to this or that change in their parameters. Sometimes they manage to uh, uh, change in ways that you thoroughly didn't expect, in, including in ways that, that involve far less uh, uh, extreme oscillations than you would have expected. Other times, a small change that you think won't cause much to go wrong will cause the whole thing to flip over and fall apart. You don't know because the system is too complex, and, and the climate system is absolutely unfathomably complex. So we don't know how it will respond. But we do know that a possibility, because we've seen it before in the, in the Permian-Triassic extinction event, we do know that a possibility is that a very abrupt warming, which would cause a very abrupt change in the chemistry of the oceans and uh, a, a huge mass extinction. And in that kind of a scenario, Lord only knows whether or not there'll be any hominids left uh, in 100 or 200 years. We do know that if there are, they won't have a civilization because there'll be no physical basis for one. So that could happen, but we can't know that it's going to happen. We can't know much about the future except that it's going to change, and at this point in time, it's changing quite rapidly. And one more where, I, again, you're, I keep asking you to make predictions that you're loath to make since you're not Nostradamus, you're a, a mathematician, <laughs> not, a, uh, not a prophet. But just, just talk briefly about uh, nuclear war that you have mentioned a couple of times, mm -hmm. that the, the, the nuclear war threat, as all of this starts to become unglued, that the the threat of nuclear war is going to keep as all these other threats that the threat of nuclear war is certainly going to be growing over the, the next decade or two yeah i would I would consider it our 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 number one near term risk in terms of a 
of a, a species extinction event um, because uh, we've already stum uh, come very close to stumbling into it um, in the past. And the, the kinds of stresses that we're going to see geopolitically over the course of the next 10 to 20 years are going to be unprecedented. We're going to have hundreds of millions of people uh, who are desperate to survive and governments that are going to be unable to remain stable in the face of that. And some of those governments have nuclear weapons. And one thinks, of course, immediately of Pakistan and India. Um, but it's not inconceivable that, that any of our other nuclear powers could suddenly find themselves in a state of instability, even the United States, um, where someone, uh, maybe not even intentionally, but quite possibly just by being under the control of events, leads to a situation where nuclear weapons are launched. And once that, once that happens, um, you know, if there's very many of them, the immediate uh, ecological and climate consequences will be such as to, you know, a recent study showed that if it was just Pakistan and India and just a handful of nukes between them, a billion people would die within a year. Um, and, and that's a shock to the system that, you know, who knows what would occur. So, yeah, I consider that, in the near term, one of our most serious threats. And I, I, I don't like to condemn people, but, but those who had the opportunity to help reduce that nuclear threat and failed to do it have a lot to answer for, in my view. Okay, well, it's just... Uh, but but you, you still... All right, uh, I, I have to ask you, uh, Sid Smith, are you uh, an optimist, a pessimist, or a realist? <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I, I seem to be all of those things, depending on who you ask. Um, you know, if you read the comments on my How to Enjoy the End of the World video, um, I've got people who accuse me of spreading hopium, right, because the end of the world is coming and we're all going to die, and they know it. And I've got plenty of people who accuse me of being a doomsayer, you know, and, and, and uh, a mad professor and all that stuff as well. Um, I'm just someone who, uh, you know, I love the earth, I love humanity, uh, I love people. Um, I would like, I would like to see us continue, um, but you know, I have my own spiritual foundations, and uh, uh, I, I think that uh, it's a great blessing just to be able to have a human life at any time, uh, and uh, what the future brings, we'll we'll all see. I don't know. I'm just trying to understand it like everybody else. But you are not a proponent of a voluntary human extinction movement. You 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 want to keep humans around. You don't think oh, we should just go. Sure. Over. Yeah. No. I I think I think that's kind of that 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 kind of thinking has no attraction for me at all. Yeah. Uh, humans have been around for you know comparatively short time, a few hundred thousand years. Um, Something very like ourselves has been around for at least 12,000 years. You know, we've had civilization. Um, I don't, I have a great respect for Derek Jensen and, and a lot of the thinking that he has done. However, I think that, um, you know, there's civilization and there's civilization. Human beings just are the kind of creature they are, and nature will decide whether or not it's sustainable. Um, but I think you just have to embrace being and, and being the kind of thing that one is. Um, and uh, I, I, I think separating oneself from the world or separating oneself from one's own species, I think that's, that's more part of the problem than part of the solution. Um, I think we need to embrace life and embrace what we are and embrace where we are and when we are and live the best life we can. I think that's, that's what we're called upon to do. And I think if we're doing that, then, then that's the way toward the best outcome that's possible. Okay, and one, one more question before our, our wrap-up. Uh, I, I couldn't hear what you said. I played it two or three times. You said something about dark humor, that you're a fan of... You said dark humor <laughs> right? is like... Yeah. But I couldn't hear in the video, so... So not everyone's humor. a fan of dark humor. They say dark humor is like food. Not everyone gets it. Oh, like food? Which is an example of dark humor, right? <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, not everyone gets That's it. An old, but... It's an old joke. Uh, dark humor. Okay, now, I, I just couldn't, I guess it was the word, that it just, it just broke. So so you do uh, admit to having a dark sense of humor. I, I mean, I, I always do. say if you, if you lose your sense of humor, that's that's it. You're still holding on to a sense of humor. 
Oh, absolutely. I always tell people that life is a whole lot easier if you keep your sense of humor where you can find it. Yeah, it, 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 it's getting tough, but uh, yeah, the dark sense of humor. But but Sydney Smith, good Lord, we are 55 minutes into this. So if you have watched any of my videos, you know the question I'm getting ready to ask you. If you were not talking to Sam Mitchell uh, at Collapse Chronicles, where you had one hour to uh, ex expand upon your philosophy, but you actually had the mainstream media uh, with a microphone in your face saying, Sid Smith... You have 60 seconds to send your message to humanity in the opening bell of 2020. What would your 60-second soundbite to humanity sound like? So the reason modern culture is something that I celebrate the end of is because it isn't really culture. Um, one of the things that happened in the last 100 years is the commodification of human culture, especially in the West. There's a fantastic documentary on this. I recommend it to everyone. It's by a man named Adam Curtis from the BBC about 10 years ago called The Century of the Self. Our culture was captured and commodified, and that destroys humanness. And so the most important thing I think a person can do is to take an axe to their television um, and, and, and drop their subscriptions to commercial magazines and, and turn off the... Get the commercialism out of your life, Right. Uh, withdraw from all the commercialized things, right? They've commodified sports, they've commodified art, they've commodified music. Pull back and find the authentic, find the truly human, not just, you know, through media, but also right there in your own community because there are people making music, making art, making story, making theater. Um, re recover human culture because... That is the foundation on which we build real human communities that have in the past and can once again live sustainably in balance with our ecosystem. But I think that's an essential thing to do or it won't be possible. Okay, and with those wise words, we're going to have to bring this to an end because Global industrial civilization is getting ready to collapse in a couple of minutes here on this battery. So stick around for a minute after we close down, uh, Sid. But for right now, guys, I hate to say this, but we're going to have to bring this conversation with Sid Smith to a close. And folks, if you enjoyed this conversation, would you please take a few seconds to go over there and thumbs up this video, or if you did not enjoy what Sid had to tell you, uh, spend a few seconds to thumb it down, and by all means, subscribe to Collapse Chronicles while you're over there. And with that little piece of business out of the way, Sid Smith, we really appreciate you taking an hour out of your schedule to come talk to us at Collapse Chronicles. And more importantly, we really appreciate all that you do to help spread the truth with a capital T and keep up the good fight and happy 2020. Well, thank you very much, Sam, and thank you again for the opportunity. I've greatly enjoyed it. Bye, guys.